The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. By now, you've likely heard about the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. The bridge is an important interstate link near the city's port. Scott Thompson will get some basic insight into the situation from a trucker's perspective from OOIDA Executive Vice President Louis Pugh. The Truck Leasing Task Force sought outside opinions about the lease purchase business model at the Mid-America Trucking Show, and much of what they heard reinforced what they already know. It's ruining livelihoods. Scott breaks down the public hearing. The last and only 2025 Peterbilt 389C is up for grabs, and all for a good cause. The truck is part of a sweepstakes that will go to benefit the Wounded Warrior Project. We'll have more from that announcement that happened at Matt's, as well as the Howes Hall of Fame new inductee. And finally, a lawmaker in Georgia is working to overturn a measure that allows someone to file a direct action lawsuit against a trucker's insurance company. We'll find out about that and more from our state legislative expert, Keith Goble. But first, here's Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. We're following updates out of Maryland, where the I-695 Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed early Tuesday morning. Authorities say every indication points to this being an accident, but the National Transportation Safety Board is leading an investigation that's already underway. The bridge snapped into the river below after being hit by a container ship that had lost power moments after its operators issued a mayday call. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said during a news conference that the mayday call saved lives as it gave authorities time to shut off vehicle traffic on the bridge. Bridge. Now, the, the thing that we know is that, uh, you know, even as the boat was coming in, you know, we had a ship that was coming in at eight knots. Uh, so coming in at a, at a, at a very, a very rapid speed. Um, we do know that uh, the investigation is, is, is currently going on. Uh, but I, I have to say I'm thankful for the folks who, who once the, you know, once the warning came up and once notification came up uh, that there was a mayday, who literally by being able to stop cars from coming over the bridge, uh, these people are heroes. They saved lives last night. As of our recording time, at least six people remained unaccounted for after falling into the water. As the search played out, transportation officials were making traffic plans. Francis Scott Key Bridge is an essential part of Interstate 695. I want to bring in OID Executive Vice President Louis Pugh now for some analysis on the situation there. Louis, you are quite familiar with this area, very familiar. Yeah, I mean, the majority of my trucking career was to the East Coast, and then I spent a lot of time, I hauled these chemical totes, a kind of LTL deal, up and forth from New York City all the way down to Richmond. So I was through there a lot, and a lot with hazardous material. And we're going to talk about alternate routes here in just a moment, but... To give us a sense of the mess that this is going to create, we're talking about a bridge now that is going to be down for months, could be longer than that. We don't know, obviously, at this point, but this is going to be a big deal for a pretty long time, right? Oh, it's going to be a disaster in one aspect. I mean, I was thinking about that this morning. I mean, once, you know, the shock and awe of it, it's all over and seeing everything. But I was just thinking, I used to deliver a lot, I, honestly, on exactly both sides of that bridge i would have stops in sparrows point you immediately come out of sparrows point drop south on the bridge and get off at the very next exit at four smallwood road which is on the other side of the bridge and deliver to a power plant and grace chemical in some places so what originally used to be maybe three mile drive you're gonna have to go completely and i was hazardous so i would have to go completely around the city on the beltway both ways to make those deliveries. And I I just can't imagine what this is going to be like. Yeah, and I I don't think we really have a full grasp of what it's going to be like yet, obviously, because this is so new in in what happened. But uh, as you mentioned there, it's going to disrupt a lot of people out there. One one thing I want to talk about, too, um, we're talking about a tragedy here. Uh, You know, as we're speaking right now, at least six people, I think, are still unaccounted for. Uh, So obviously we're, we're hoping that they find those folks safe. Um, But I want to also point out that this happened at the very early morning hours of Tuesday, right? If something like this had happened 
during rush hour, even just a few hours later, we'd be talking about a massive tragedy. Oh, yes, massive. And, I mean, it doesn't lighten the fact that we got six people yeah, missing and probably, sure. unfortunately, have went on. But with that being said, I can't imagine what this would have been like if it had been in the morning or the afternoon, in the daytime, anytime. I mean, we're talking the I-95 corridor and probably one of the most, if not the most, heavily traveled areas and parts of it. I mean, it goes from freaking Florida all the way to Maine. So, yeah. <laughs> and lots of goods, lots of services, lots of people. And especially from Richmond North, it really gets crazy. And I, like I said, I can't imagine the backups for the tunnels and the bridges. And, you know, if you're a hazmat hauler, you can't go through those tunnels. So you have to go around the outside on the west side, which takes a lot longer. It's just. This is just massive, and I feel for the truckers. I feel for the families that were part of this, but the yeah, truckers and sure. everybody trying to make deliveries, and what a mess. Let's talk about what this is going to look like for the people who have to navigate around this situation there. And you've been talking, I believe, with the Federal Highway Administration, giving them some feedback and some tips about where people should maybe be looking to go. Yeah, in fact, it was the freight whatever they call their freight arm of Federal Highway, the people who overlook the movement of freight yeah, and goods. Yeah. And we were talking about that first thing. That's after a little bit ago, in fact, they called, reached out for just OI to take, what our members are doing. And I pointed out, I said, well, a lot of people probably, if you run out there a lot like I did, you know other ways to go and people don't. But, I mean, right now they're pushing everybody through the Tunnel 195 or 895 and then, of course, if you have hazmat, they tell you if you're going north or south, you have to take 695. But you have to take it on the east side or the west side now, excuse me, right. not the east side. The east side was the short way around. You now have to take the long way around. Um, one thing I did point out to them and suggested was maybe they put out there, especially for people who aren't as familiar with the area. If you're running from north to south and you're just running through, meaning you don't have a delivery between Washington, D.C. and the Delaware state line, it would probably behoove you to run, um, if you're coming from north to south, get off in Delaware on 301, run 301 down across to 50, and then across the Bay Bridge, and then 50 will put you over back on the bypass around D.C. or 495, and you can just go on south to Richmond or wherever. And the same coming north, just the other way. You get on 50, 495 around the east side of D.C., you hop on 50, cross the Bay Bridge, and then you can go north on 301. That brings you up at the Delaware, just, just on the other side of the Delaware line. It's pretty good running. It's actually only about 20 miles longer than if you go right up through the tunnel in the okay. middle on 95. It's the same amount of miles if you take the hazmat around route around the east side of th or west side of town right. in Baltimore. Right, right. And it just, you completely avoid Baltimore, which, I mean, right now, I don't think you want to be anywhere near Baltimore no. in this. And this is going to last for a while. 301's good road. It's good highway. 50, it's all good roads. So, you know. Yeah, obviously, this is a fluid situation. We don't know what the long-term plan is right now, but we'll be hearing those plans, I'm sure, over the coming days as we get more information about what exactly happened and how long it's going to take to, to rebuild this bridge and, and everything else in between. So we'll keep an eye on that. Louis, we appreciate you being here and providing some perspective on this. And again, our thoughts and prayers really do go out to those people who are still unaccounted for and their families, and we hope for, for good news there. But we appreciate your time. Thank you. And we should mention before we go here, chart.maryland.gov. That is the website to go to for traffic updates as this tragedy comes into focus here uh, and we get more information about what this closure is going to look like over the long term. Again, chart.maryland.gov. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Scott. Next, we'll report on the latest meeting of the Truck Leasing Task Force at the Mid-America Trucking Show. Ashley Blackford will tell us about a truck sweepstakes that will benefit a good cause. And our state legislative expert, Keith Goebel, will discuss a Georgia bill to stop so-called direct action lawsuits. We'll be back in just a moment with more news and information. Please stay with us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. 
Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Buckling up keeps everyone safe on the roads. Learn more at www.sharetheroadsafely.gov. Paid for by FMCSA. Landline Now, welcome back. It's hard to get most people to agree on anything these days, but when it comes to lease purchase agreements in the trucking industry, there's something resembling a consensus. And Justin Martin, a trucker who spoke during FMCSA's Truck Leasing Task Force public meeting at the Mid-America Trucking Show, summed the predatory agreements up like this. But the lease purchase program, it's, it's a total scam. There is no fixing it. It needs to go away. Like, it's, it's complete indentured servitude. That's, that's, basically, that's basically what it is. Since they started meeting last year, the Truck Leasing Task Force has been holding discussions within the group, many of them questioning the lease purchase model itself, wondering out loud with supporting evidence whether the model is worth saving. Those that spoke at Matt's either in person or online reinforced that notion. The horror stories that had been relayed in previous sessions now given a face and a voice and an experience, most of those experiences being very negative. Take Shelley Vandenberg, an OIDA member from Idaho, for example. She was in Louisville for the show and told the task force members and FMCSA officials in attendance that these predatory carriers often use a bait-and-switch approach to get drivers to sign a contract. She says her experience started in 2018 when she and her husband entered into a lease purchase agreement. We were charged $175,000 for a 2018 uh, Kenworth T680 with approximately 100,000 miles on it. Although he never recorded the miles. $3,000 down for the setup fees and costs with $1,250 biweekly. The brochure had promised us no money down and payments as low as $1,500 a month, but that was not the case at all. Maintenance costs were always 100% on us regardless of what the contract said. Struggling to keep their head above water, Vandenberg and her husband attended OIDA's Truck to Success seminar, parted ways with the company she signed the lease purchase agreement with, and tried to move on. But she says that's when the real trouble started. First, she found out the company had locked her out of her authority, and that was just the start. They had um, our, locked us out of our business account with the Secretary of State, and they had locked us out of our insurance. Uh, we had no control over any aspect of our identities, uh, on our business accounts, our permits, anything. Uh, they had put themselves as registered agents and uh, authorized representatives over every aspect of our company. Some serious financial repercussions are one result of predatory lease purchase agreements, but it goes beyond that. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration launched this task force because of the safety implications. Brian Stansbury, the agency's chief counsel, explained that during his opening statement at the MADS meeting. We have utmost respect for our drivers. And while sometimes I know uh, FMCSA isn't always seen as the best friend of the drivers, we are your regulators. We want to do what we can to help drivers experience the American dream in a safe environment. Sometimes that relates to driving conditions. But we're here today because of the threat that can be posed by truck leasing. Now, done properly, truck leasing can open the door to prosperity. It can give somebody the ability to start driving, to earn a living, support their family, and start building their piece of the American dream. But we have seen too many examples where that is not the case. Too many examples where there is predatory behavior, confusing contracts, um, sometimes outright duplicitous behavior that can leave drivers underwater, leave drivers in conditions where they are not able to keep their trucks up to a safe state. And that puts everybody at risk, and it makes it harder for these drivers to build a career. In many cases, we have seen drivers exit the industry in financial ruin. This is not what we want. 
we at FMCSA want to ensure that truck leasing is a gateway to prosperity, not a pathway to suffering and exit from the industry. Tom Weekly, director of operations for the OID Foundation, stood up and echoed that sentiment during the public comment period as well. The other thing I always bring in with FMCSA especially is I haven't heard anything about safety being involved, which is obviously something they're very concerned about. And we need to be sure to understand that when you're under any kind of pressure like that, we know. I'd like to see a little more study on they're not making their payments, so they're running a little faster. Let's just be honest. If I can't make my payments, I've got to do whatever I can to make those payments, take care of my family. I had two boys and trying to bring them all up too when I was young. And, you know, I'm going to do some things that I wouldn't normally do because I've got to make those payments. So I think we need to expand that a little bit more into the safety situation. And I was never in a lease purchase program. I was offered that on all, uh, several times. And let me tell you, they can sell it. When they'll come in there and the man says to me or the recruiter says to me or the vice president and the president of the company comes in and he was a hardworking man himself earning his truck and he's just like us and I'm I'm going to hear for you and you know we have an open door policy. If you have any problems, you just come in and talk to me because I too came up this way. So I believe in you. I support you 100 percent. That's pretty hard not to buy into. So you you do and suddenly you realize that's just not the way it works. So getting back to where we started, there was widespread agreement throughout the public hearing at Matt's about the nature of the problem. The truck leasing task force's job, however, isn't just to point out the problems, a job they're doing quite well. It's also to come up with possible solutions. And while truck drivers like Justin Martin or even Shelley Vandenberg might argue that there is no saving it, that there is no fixing it, the discussions about how you might do that continue. Paul Cullen Jr., a task force member with the Cullen Law Firm, suggested eliminating the model where motor carriers are the ones that loan the truck to the driver. The one concept that I'd like to keep on the table uh, for our discussions and our recommendations uh, is the idea that no motor carrier should own the debt of a driver. When a motor carrier owns the debt of a driver, and actually, I'll mention this in a moment, is constantly creating the debt of the driver and they are able to do that by by dent of the a truth and leasing uh, a um, lease purchase agreement they have supreme control over the driver and this goes to the controlling the driver's finances how they operate on the road whether they're pressured to drive when they are tired for for example or sick and how or when they repair their truck. How, my, the question I have is how can motor carriers, most often, what, why can drivers, uh, individuals, why can they not get truck, lease trucks from traditional leasing companies like Joshua's there? And I believe we've heard testimony that the reason is that um, drivers who cannot get um, traditional uh, loans or lease agreements are, uh, are they cannot be underwritten. The 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 standards of the those organizations, those lending organizations, doesn't reach the individuals who are typically caught up in uh, these truck leasing uh, programs. So how can carriers provide leases to drivers that traditional? lending companies cannot well the reason is is that they have complete control over those uh drivers they have they control their work their compensation and let me just mention it's it's this is something i think is uh obvious to those in the industry but it's not always obvious outside the compensation is not drivers are not salaried they're paid by the mile or by the load, and that changes the, the number of loads or the the number of miles of the loads that you are you can be dispatched as a driver can vary from week to week, and that's a again a source of the power of the comp- of the carrier over the mm-hmm. driver, and that affects their compensation, and it affects and the and the carrier um, controls their costs. Often in these contracts, the driver will be required to 
only use particular repair facilities, often the carrier's repair facility and the carrier will come up with the price and make deductions from their compensation. And so it's this control, uh, everything about the, the economics of a driver's work is controlled by the person who owns the debt. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the, these worst case scenarios arise out of. And so the idea that I, I just want to keep on the table that the idea that we propose or recommend uh, that motor carriers um, not be allowed to hold the debt of drivers. If it's if lease purchases are a useful um, tool and drivers are a good risk, individuals are a good risk, then the traditional uh, leasing uh, uh, companies and truck finance companies will take care of them. Now, to be fair, not all lease purchase agreements are predatory. Some have pointed to success stories, using them as a reason for keeping the model, but tweaking it where it needs tweaking. Clifford Lawrence Peterson, currently a company driver, has been trucking for 25 years. He told the group he's been a lease purchase driver for 17 of those years. I have been in nine different lease purchase programs with nine different companies. And out of the nine, two Two companies, I actually built equity and became successful as an owner-operator. Not a very high success rate, which Peterson later acknowledged. I'm a Marine veteran. I have no quit in me. <laughs> so I kept trying and kept trying. I finally found two that I've been privileged to be with that I was successful at. Peterson admitted that the seven companies he had bad experiences with were all pretty much consistent in their treatment of drivers. They short miles so the drivers don't do anything but pay off truck bills and can't take home a paycheck. They skim off the top. If you're if they're paying a percentage, they skim off the top. They don't tell you exactly what you're supposed to be getting a percentage of, and they steal from that from you that way. They turn around and overcharge you for maintenance and things like that because you're having to get it fixed where they want to get it fixed instead of where you want to get it fixed, or even simple oil changes. I paid $900 for an oil change. It's ridiculous. And another way that they, they cheat you is they'll bring you on board. They'll run you like crazy for like the first 90 days. So if you're happy, you're, oh, you're doing great. You're making money. You might even recruit another driver for them because you're doing good. And then the next thing you know, you're not taking home a paycheck and you'll go a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. I went two months one time without a paycheck. When you have a family at home, you can't afford that. When one of the panels said that, that it borderlines criminal, it is criminal. What they do is criminal and it, they need to be prosecuted for it. You need to have ways to, for drivers to, to come at these companies because they know if you go into these programs, you can't afford a lawyer. And then at the same time, no carrier ever should be able to build their fleet by retaining and reselling lease purchase trucks over and over again. A damning assessment of the lease purchase model, and yet Peterson doesn't want it blown up. Definitely regulated and overhauled. Getting rid of, no, because it is an avenue for, for young guys to come into this industry. I started in this industry in 1993, had no business sense whatsoever, had no idea how to run a trucking company, and that was my first gig was a lease purchase. It's a good opportunity to become an owner-operator, but you have to be disciplined. You have to learn some business. You have to learn how to rebuild your credit because a lot of times you get into this programs because you don't have the credit. So you have to learn how to be disciplined. You have to learn how to rebuild your credit. And you have to learn and build relationships on how to be successful as an owner-operator. Food for thought for the Truck Leasing Task Force members who, again, heard a lot of things that do reinforce what they've been saying during meetings for months. The task force will be back at it soon, and at the end of their work, will make recommendations to the Secretary of Transportation and Secretary of Labor about what they think should be done. Reporting for Landline Now, I'm Scott Thompson, and we're back right after this.
Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Dispatch, I picked up that load of steel, so I'm ready to roll. Sounds good. Remember, we're getting paid by weight, so make sure to use a cat scale. <laughs> I wouldn't weigh anywhere else. Forget this accuracy when you check on a cat scale. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline now, welcome back. Lots of beautiful trucks filled the showroom at the Mid-America Trucking Show, but one stood out at the Rush Truck Center's booth. Rush Enterprises, Inc., in conjunction with Rush Enterprises Foundation, announced at Maths that it would be doing a special sweepstakes for the chance to win the last and only 2025 Peterbilt Model 389C ever produced. The money raised will go to benefit the Wounded Warrior Project. Jake Narotsky is the spokesperson for the project. I talked to him at the show about the announcement. And talk to me about what you're up to today. Uh, so we just had the opportunity today to come uh, step in with Rush and Peterbilt and serve alongside them today as they get ready to uh, sweep stakes off this truck. This is It's beyond me the number of people that this truck is going to help. Uh, just because other people want to be generous with their time and 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 help out with it. Now you shared a little bit of your story. I'm going to ask you to do that again. Just just briefly, um, talk to me about your background and how you got involved with the Wounded Warrior Project. Yeah, so I uh, spent 14 years in the United States Army. I was a crew chief on the UH-60 Blackhawks, and uh, I just had the opportunity to serve over in Iraq in multiple tours, uh, and you know, getting out of the military and facing. All the challenges that go with getting out as well as facing the injuries that I had been hiding over the years um, because you want to serve, you want to stay, you want to stay active. Uh, when that time came, it was kind of a flood. It was a, uh, a flood in my head and a flood in my body. And so when I left the military, it was, it was a lot. Uh, it was facing the, the physical and the mental tolls of 14 years of, of being on the front lines. And coming home to my family, I didn't realize at the time, but I was bringing that front line home. To them, I was literally parking it in my house, and so now my wife and my kids and everybody that I encounter uh, is is dealing with that as well. And so, thank heavens for Wounded Warrior Project. My wife reached out to them and, and asked them for help. Literally, just hey, help! My husband needs help. And right away, they came alongside us and swooped us right up. And um, my wife got help that she needed. I got the help that I need. Our kids have gotten the help they needed. And, uh, if it wasn't for Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, I, I wouldn't be with my family. If it wasn't for Wounded Warrior Project, I wouldn't have the opportunities I have now and uh, be able to step into my own purpose and, and find out what life had for me. And so I'm super appreciative of that and just humbled for the opportunity to travel and share my story. And not just share my stories, but share the story of so many warriors all over our country and just keep those memories and keep those thoughts alive. What would you say to um, you know a fellow fellow uh, military member who's who's listening to this and and thinking that they're struggling but they don't know how to ask for help? Wow, what a great question! Like myself and for so many other warriors, we know something's wrong. We know that something hurts and we know that something's off, but we don't even we don't even know what help we need. Um, and so, really, guys, just make a phone call. Just make a phone. Go to woundedwarriorproject.org. Um, call the resource center, reach out to a friend, and just begin the conversation. In that conversation, you'll begin to open the doors and open the thoughts of, hey, man, this is what's really going on. Hey, I'm not all alone by myself. Because the fact is that so many of us think we're an island in the middle of the ocean. So many of us stand in a room full of people and think we're the only person. And you just feel, you feel so alone. And the fact is that you're not alone. And the fact is also that you are seen. And so reaching out and just saying, hey, What's, what's out there? And starting that conversation is so important. And even more important than that, I'll say this, is that so often the warrior won't reach out for help, but it's so important for us. If we have a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a, a son, a daughter, a friend that is going through this, be the one that steps forward and says, hey, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to lay down my life to the side for a second and make it all about you. I'm going to step in and walk alongside with you in this. Uh, that's, what's, that's what's important. We have to grab each other and do this together. What does it mean for um, all the people who've come together to to do this this truck, this sweepstakes, um, to, to go to support this project? You know, like I said in my speech earlier, that night in Iraq, when our helicopter was under fire and we were using it 
to draw away the attention so we could pull our wounded back. We didn't know what to do, but we knew we had to do something. And so we did what we could that night. And it's so amazing that so many others now, we don't all know what to do. And we can't, we can't save everybody, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And so somebody might come up here and to them, they, it's $50, it's a sweepstake entry. No, that's $50 that's going to help a warrior somewhere. It's going to change a life. It's going to change a family. It's going to bring a family back together again. And so um, really it's everybody here making that, making that decision. Um, hey, I'm going to step on the front lines now. I'm going to stand side by side. That's really important because it takes, it takes a, everybody. That was Jake Narotsky with the Wounded Warrior Project. I also spoke with Gary Willis, who is the president of marketing and communications for Rush Enterprises. Talk to me about what's going on today. Yeah, so we're really excited. You know, we're uh, giving away the last uh, Peterbilt 389 in the only model year 2025 uh, 389. Uh, and that's a really special truck, and we want to do something special with it, right? So we decided to partner with the Wounded Warrior Project to do a sweepstakes. And so between now and September 15th of this year, uh, we are uh, taking taking donations at winthelast389.com um, of $50 or more. Uh, and when you do that, you're automatically entered to win uh, this truck. And we're going to select the winner uh, uh, after September 15th and announce that winner at the ATA MCE show uh, in Nashville on October 14th. So we're really excited and we hope everybody will kind of come and help us uh, support the Wounded Warrior Project and the great work that they're doing. Now, in, in getting your name in for this, I believe it's, is it a minimum $50 donation to the Wounded Warrior Project? It's, yeah, $50. Uh, it's $50 per entry, so you can enter as many times as you want. Uh, one entry is $50, but if you want to buy 10 entries, you're welcome to do that, you know, uh, and increase your odds. And for, for our radio listeners, of course, uh, describe what the truck looks like. Well, the truck is beautiful. It is it is a uh, bright red with uh, kind of an old school uh, white stripe down the side. Uh, and it is actually painted in that scheme uh, to match a 1965 uh, Peterbilt that sits at our Rush uh, Enterprises headquarters in New Braunfels, Texas. That's the year that our company was founded. Um, and so we wanted to uh, kind of... Uh, do a little bit of a tribute to our history as well. So we painted this truck to match that one exactly. So it's it's a really beautiful, uh, a beautiful truck, chromed out, a lot of special lighting on it. And uh, uh, we know somebody's going to be really lucky to, get, to win this truck. That was Gary Willis with Rush Enterprises talking about the special sweepstakes. Matt's was also where Joshua Giesbrecht, a.k.a. Trucker Josh, was inducted into the Howes Hall of Fame. I sat down with him and Rob Howes the second to discuss the announcement. So, starting off, tell me what we're doing here today. Uh, yeah, we're here at Mid America Trucking Show 2024, and we're celebrating our newest inductee to the House Hall of Fame. Now, for those who aren't familiar, what is the House Hall of Fame, and how do people get inducted? We uh, started the House Hall of Fame back in 2020, and uh, it was celebrating our 100 year anniversary, and we wanted to have a way to give back to the industries that have made us uh, what we are now. So. We started the House Hall of Fame in order to celebrate the people, places, and things of the trucking and farming industries. Talk to me about this year's uh, nominee or, and inductee. Uh, here we're celebrating Trucker Josh as our newest inductee, and he is going to share the life of the trucker with everybody, or does, I should say, uh, for the past 13 years now. Yeah, every um, day. Over 3,000 videos where he has been able to paint a picture of what it's like to be a trucker, what it's like to have a family, uh, and be able to juggle both things, which is not an easy thing to do, um, and share tips and tricks on uh, the everyday uh, goings-on, I should say, of, uh, of trucking. Mm -hmm. Josh, congratulations. How does it feel to be inducted? I'm honored. I am uh, absolutely honored to be here with uh, Rob. And the team here, it's been an amazing experience so far and uh, uh, it's been great. Tell me a little bit about what it is you do. So online, I share my life every day. As a truck driver, I'm international, so I'm based in Canada, but I travel to the US back and forth and I share every day everything about the life. Uh, it's a daily vlog, so from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, every day. So it gives people real insight into the entire lifestyle, not just a little snippet here and there. I'm not trying to necessarily sell anybody on trucking, but I hope that 
because I love what I do so much, I hope that the experience of it will bring new people into the industry. When you started doing these videos, what was the goal and did you expect it to land you where you are today? I absolutely did not expect it to land me at a table with Rob House. No, this uh, was outside of my imagination at the beginning. So I started off in 2011 and I wanted to show people what the life was like because there's so many misconceptions. There's a, a lot of stereotypes that go along with being a trucker that people who don't grow up in this industry like I did, they have no idea because a trucker lives a very solitary lifestyle. So it's hard for people to see the inside uh, from an inside perspective. Uh, so I wanted to show them back home. Started off with just my friends. I wanted to show them how great of a time I was having. I was loving what I, what I was doing. I still love it. And then more people started watching and I realized these people weren't my family members. I was like, these were new random people watching me every day. And so I kept making more and more videos and more and more people kept joining the channel. And it just sort of snowballed from there. And uh, opportunity after opportunity has sort of presented itself as the channel's grown. And uh, here we are today, sitting at the table. Wow. Now you say you grew up in a trucking family? I did, yep. My dad was a trucker my whole life. So on my summers uh, between school, I would go on the road with him. Whereas a lot of my friends, they would go, you know, to the park, sort of their friend's house, enjoy their summers. I would go on the road and spend it trucking. So since I was eight years old, this is what I knew that I was gonna do. And here I am today, I've been driving 17 years. What would you say some of the misconceptions are when it comes to trucking that you're trying to change? A lot of it just comes from innocent ignorance, I think. Uh, people see truckers or they, they almost look down on truckers as a, 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 lower, a lower career, I guess. They are dehumanized sometimes on the road. You know, we're big, we're heavy, we're slow, we're in everybody's way, and we know that. I wanted to show everybody that there's a person. I wanted to show everybody that there's a human being behind the wheel of that truck who's got a family at home, who's got a story. And I wanted to share that story to help people who maybe don't know and who didn't grow up around trucks uh, realize the lifestyle. What does it mean to get this honor to get inducted to the, to the Hall of Fame? It means a lot to me. It, it, to me, it means that my focus, what I've had over all of these years, has followed through into my work. That I've wanted to be a positive influence in the trucking industry, to lift people up, show the positive side of it, maybe teach a few things along the way, and to be inducted into the Hall of Fame here. Uh, I'm humbled and honored that uh, they recognized uh, the work I've done over the past years, and uh, it, it does mean a lot to me. Is this, having him inducted and, and showing what trucking is like, is the hope that it inspires new drivers um, to look into this career or, or learn more about it? Yeah, I don't think it's a hope. I think it's a, a certainty. I mean, you've heard stories already from some of your viewers, right, about uh, people that have gotten into trucking because of your channel. And I think that that's uh, an, an amazing story to be able to tell. and. Uh, and, a, and a needed one right now in, in you know, the, the world we live in. Uh, unfortunately, trucking is becoming a, a, a more estranged role and uh, newer drivers are becoming more and more sparse. So uh, to have somebody that can inspire and uh, bring new drivers in there is, is a wonderful thing. We're having a hard time getting new drivers, getting new young drivers. The driving force out there is aging and they're aging out and we're wondering in the future who are we going to replace them with because people my age don't seem to be too interested in driving truck and I wanted to show them it's a lot of fun and you can make a good living and you can support a family and you can get it done and have a lot of fun along the way. What is it like to get a comment or run into somebody who says you know I never considered trucking until I watched your channel and now it's what I do? It makes me happy. It makes me happy. I'm glad that I can help people towards a career that they'll love. It's not for everybody, and I, I tell everybody that. It, don't, don't feel bad if you find out it's not for you. But a lot of people don't know anything about the lifestyle. I say, give it a shot. That was Rob Howe II and trucker Josh talking about the Howe's Hall of Fame. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. Capital Reman, your leader in remanufactured diesel engines and components, is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Let us help you avoid costly downtime and repairs by visiting CapitalReman.com today. Use code OOIDA10 to receive your member benefits.
Stock up on Howe's Diesel Treat, the nation's most trusted anti-gel. And to be safe from the harshest winter conditions, make sure you have Howe's Diesel Lifeline on hand, the fastest-acting gelling rescue product. Available nationwide, Howe's products are designed to keep you rolling through the toughest conditions. Visit Howe'sProducts.com. Attention professional drivers, are you behind on your tax filings? You owe money? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. You watch the road, we'll keep an eye on the IRS. Call now. 855-976-4291. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com. Because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Welcome back to the home stretch of our show today. Scott Thompson here, joined in Studio A by Keith Goebel of Landline Magazine to go over some of the latest legislative news on the state level, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So we'll get right to it. Keith, how are you? Scott, doing well. You know, we've actually got a lot of good ground to cover, I think. Yeah. You, you might prove me wrong, but I, I think I think we've got some positive news here. Well, you've uh, you've set us up for, for failure and disappointment here, but we'll see how we do, Keith. Uh, we're going to start in Georgia, a state that employs a so-called direct action rule for truck drivers. There is an effort underway to repeal it, but first we should, I think, start with the rule itself because I'm not sure it's something that uh, gets talked about very often. Uh, so let's talk about the direct action rule that Georgia has. What is it? Yeah, this goes back uh, almost 100 years now, if you can believe it, uh, 1930s that, that it's been in place. And, um, yeah, it uh, allows, um, you know, for uh, uh, whenever you've got um, individuals, if they're involved in an incident with a truck, they are allowed to sue uh, the company, the truck driving company, their insurance company, allowed to insure and su- uh, sue that company directly. Um, that's something that only there's only a handful of states that that still have that in place. Now, uh, you know, again, we're talking about a, a law that's been in place for almost a hundred years. Um, of course, back in the day, it was an issue uh, being able to you know locate uh, p- possibly a trucking operation and that sort of thing. So, I mean, that was the reasoning behind it once upon a time, but. Almost all states, if they did have a rule similar to Georgia, uh, they got rid of it as you know things have become more modernized. Uh, but they haven't done that in Georgia. So anyway, this legislation is an attempt to join just about every other state in the country with um, you know uh, putting in place some limits on the, what the lawsuits you know filed by individuals, uh, if they're injured in a truck-related crash, uh, they wouldn't be able to go directly to uh, uh, the insurance company to, uh, to file file action. Yeah, and you said off the top here we're going to cover, cover some positive ground today. That would imply that this currently has negative implications on truck drivers, right? So the, the idea yeah. here is that it is uh, affecting them negatively because essentially people are going around the process to make it difficult for them. Yeah, certainly. It does not make for a business-friendly environment there in Georgia, uh, and which is the concern uh, you know, for, for trucking operations there and uh, being able to be insured. Uh, the cost of insurance, of course, you know, related to this uh, in Georgia has definitely uh, gotten quite uh, expensive uh, in, in, in the past few years. So, you know, this was one of the topics, this direct action rule was one of the topics a year ago uh, there was a special panel of leg- of lawmakers that was created to look into truck issues, trying to improve uh, uh, trucking operations, and and um, there in the state. And this was one of the leading um, points that was that was brought up that needed to be addressed. And and um, you know it was introduced. Um, the Senate approved it, moved its way over to the House. The House voted unanimously. Uh, to forward this on to the governor's desk, uh, worth noting that the lieutenant governor is in favor of this change and advocated for it along the way. So at this point, the expectation is not if it will be signed into law, it is a matter of when it will be signed into law. 
And uh, with that, you know, there will be um, some some improvements as far as, uh, you know, for, for trucking insurance uh, there in the state of Georgia. Yeah, and I know that supporters of the bill have mentioned that this puts the state at a competitive disadvantage as well or has for, mm-hmm. for decades now. So, And, and it is worth noting yeah. – and one of the things that they addressed in the legislation, uh, again, eliminating this law, there are exceptions to it and it, there are obvious exceptions, which makes sense. Uh, you know, if, uh, if the trucking operation enters bankruptcy, they could still – um, go directly uh, to the insurer of the of the trucking operation, or if the the company cannot be located, as folks know, there are occasions when a trucking operation you can't find them. Where are they? What happened to them? Uh, in that particular case, they would still be allowed in the state of Georgia to go directly um, after the insurance company. As you said there, it looks like a matter of when, not if. Governor Brian Kemp signs that one into law, and you'll keep us updated on that, I'm sure. Let's shift topics here and move to the Midwest, uh, to Indiana, and a couple other states, actually, that are looking at possible changes to pain and suffering damages and in incidents involving large trucks. Uh, Indiana um, making some moves on this. Yeah, this one really goes after uh, their, their seatbelt rule. Of course, you know, we've talked about Maybe not so much on here, but I know folks are familiar with, uh, you know, over the past decade or so, states moving from uh, uh, secondary enforcement to allowing primary enforcement. But that is, you know, not not so much uh, the issue here. It is just whether uh, if you're involved in an incident involving a truck, and this obviously is the focus here, um, in the past – Indiana law has prohibited seatbelt information from being made available to juries. It's not something that would be entered into uh, evidence is whenever they're trying to decide, um, uh, you know, responsibility or, um, you know, liability. So what this legislation is doing, and it's been signed into law there in Indiana, allows for the seatbelt usage to be considered in these uh, accident lawsuits, um, Worth pointing out, it doesn't require that seatbelt usage be considered in an accident lawsuit. It allows the judge – I mean the judge could still come in and say they don't want uh, um, whether or not the the person that involved or the people involved were in a seatbelt. That would still be up to the judge for final uh, – for, for final decision. But – the ability juries can, with this bill being signed into law, they can, uh, as long as the judge doesn't stop it, uh, and they can hear that information. And again, that's important because if you've got an incident between a commercial truck and a passenger vehicle, and the person in the passenger vehicle was injured, uh, was not wearing a seatbelt, mm-hmm. that obviously could uh, be factored in when oh, yeah. Absolutely. considering damages. You think. Yeah, you would think so. So Indiana, uh, that will be... The law of the land there uh, moving from, uh, I think, July 1st is when that takes effect there. So we'll uh, circle that on our calendars there. Let's move on to Wisconsin also making moves with regard to pain and suffering. Yeah, they sent a bill uh, to the governor there as well, um, limiting the total amount of non-economic damages. So, you know, pain and suffering type damages, but it would limit the total amount of those damage that a person could recover from a trucking company. Uh, specifically, we're talking about a $1 million cap. Um, now, this does not limit direct damages like medical expenses. This is focused on those pain and suffering uh, type damages. But but something that they, they have not had in place there in Wisconsin and the belief being that um, – uh, this is getting more and more out of hand uh, here in recent years, and it's really becoming problematic for uh, for insurance rates for trucking operations. Um, you know, and then you even the effect that it has on the supply chain. Uh, whenever you again have what can be some very uh, significant uh, uh, damages as far as um, again uh, pain and suffering type damages. 
Let's squeeze one more state in here, Keith, with a little bit of time to go. Illinois, what's going on there? Yeah, in Illinois, uh, legislation not as not as far along uh, as the ones we've been talking about. But, um, you know, a year ago, uh, a law was signed in Illinois that permits judges to grant unlimited non-economic damages in wrongful death lawsuits. This legislation is originating out of the Illinois House would remove that provision uh, in statute and, um, and in, in effect, uh, permit um, unlimited uh, pain and suffering damages. So looking to cap that at, at uh, a maximum of $2 million. You promised positivity, Keith, and you brought it. <laughs> we appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. And that is our show for today. We've got another one coming up soon. But in the meantime, check out Landline.media for all the latest news coming out of the trucking industry. We do thank you for listening to Landline Now. We appreciate all your time. And we'll see you around next time. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to Landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's Landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. 